Hey, my name's Harold Winter. I'm glad that you've set this time aside to worship God and to join me as we take a look at a Bible passage and put against it the question, is prayer useless? I have an answer to that. I don't know what your answer is, but James chapter 5 gives a suggestion. We're going to dig into that a little bit later on. Psalm 5 also has something to say about it. Verse 3, In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my requests before you and wait expectantly. Please join me. We're going to start with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are waiting expectantly. We have our own thoughts and questions about prayer and about how you deal with our requests and the things that we say to you. And we pray that you help us and help us grow in our faith, help us grow in our understanding and draw us closer to you as we spend this time worshiping and looking at your Bible. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we started the worship service with Psalm 5, verse 3, and that eager expectation that we have when we bring our prayers to God. But the psalm doesn't stop there. It continues. And the, the next verse is actually kind of uncomfortable. It says, For you are not a God who is pleased with wickedness. With you, evil people are not welcome. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies. The bloodthirsty and deceitful, you, Lord, detest. But, here's the good news, I, by your great love, can come into your house. In reverence, I bow down toward your holy temple. 
Uh, you might have heard before people say, well, if I was to go to church, lightning would strike me because, well, I'm not sure that I can come into the presence of a God who is holy. I love that sense of respect and awe for God. And it is true that because God is good and holy, He has a problem with people who are sinful, who are disobedient, who tell lies and who are deceitful. But He's also really, really loving. And it is by His love that we get to come into God's presence. He made it possible by coming to take the punishment for human sin. That happened at the cross when Jesus died and took the whole punishment for sin upon His own shoulders. But He didn't stay dead. He demonstrated that He defeated sin and death by rising three days later. And in His resurrection, you get the assurance, we get the assurance, that our sins completely covered over and we get to live as God's dearly, dearly loved people. It's part of that whole process of being made new that God has established for His world, reconciling all the world to Himself. It's in that hope, it's in that confidence that we do come and talk to God. It's in that assurance that we're being made to be more like Jesus, that we go into this time of worship and we dedicate the whole rest of the week to serving God, loving our neighbor, and worshiping Him in everything we do. Ordinarily, on the last Sunday in January, our boys club would participate in the worship service. We call the boys club cadets here. And they would participate by doing some of the readings and um, taking the donations up because one of the donations that we collect on the last Sunday in January is for the cadet organization. And so even though they're not meeting this season, the cadet leaders are, but not the boys, we will continue to support that ministry and get ready for when we hope we can reconvene. And so in addition to uh, collecting uh, your donations for the cadets. We also are collecting donations to support the ministries of Cross Point Community Church. Thank you very much for your support, both in prayer and by your volunteering and by the donations that you give. I'd like to lead you in prayer, but before I do that, I want to mention one of the needs that we have in our congregation. We're looking for your suggestions for who is gifted by God, shows leadership and uh, spiritual maturity to serve our congregation as an elder or as a deacon. You can see the newsletter for some of the other um, things that we're looking for, really hoping that you have some suggestions that you can forward so that we can uh, continue this process of looking for your uh, suggestions and God's leading in who can serve our congregation as an elder and as a deacon. Having said that, let's spend some time in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're really thankful for what you are doing in our world. We recognize there's challenges, there's pain and brokenness and illness within our world. But in Christ, you have started the process of making all things new. And we're really thankful for that. We pray for ongoing healing and for an end to the COVID-19 pandemic. We pray for healing for those who have become sick from COVID-19 and healing for those who are grieving because of the illness or because they've lost people that they love, either due to the illness or from other causes. We're really thankful that you hear our prayers, you hear our laments, and you respond with fatherly love. And for that, we're grateful and really, really um, take great comfort from knowing that you're close by and that you care. We're thankful for our congregation. We pray that um, you continue to build us up as a church family. We're thankful for the different ways that we have been able to connect and continue to reach out to support and encourage each other. Thank you for the phone calls that get made and the Zoom conversations and the different ways that we lift each other up in prayer as well. And Heavenly Father, 
you know that we're looking for um, people to serve as elder and deacon. We pray that you bless our process for selecting office bearers and that people whom you have gifted and called, we pray that they can serve and can find joy in this time of service. Lead and direct us in the way that we do our ministry, we, we pray. We're thankful for the leaders. We're thankful for the way that we can continue to put a message out like this through TV and YouTube. And we're thankful that we can continue to worship and glorify you. Hear our prayers and answer us. Amen. There was an update a few weeks ago on a Facebook group from Tilsonburg about the outbreak of COVID-19 in Maple Manor. Somebody replied to that update by saying, Our thoughts and prayers are for the residents and staff of Maple Manor. The next person who posted was offended by that. Thoughts and prayers are useless, they said. And they posted this meme. A truck that's empty. I'm saying that's all that thoughts and prayers are. What do you think? Do you think prayer is useless? Nothing more than a futile gesture? The Bible has something to say about thoughts and prayers. Let me read this from James chapter 5. Let's start at verse 13. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church and pray, to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick, sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Ah, we're invited to pray. Let's do that for a minute, asking for God's help to understand what we just read. Heavenly Father, that invitation is loud and clear for us to pray. And so here we are talking to you. And hear our prayer, we pray. That we can understand your word. That it can transform our imagination, our lives, our behavior. So that more and more we become people like Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. James' basic understanding of prayer is that you can talk to God about anything at any time. And maybe you've noticed for yourself, but often prayer is a knee-jerk reaction when you're facing trouble. When the car starts to slide towards the ditch on black ice. Or when the doctor enters the room with a thick file of tests and a somber look on her face. Or when the phone rings at 3.07 a.m. Often our response is to cry out for help, to ask God for help. But we often come to God with our joy as well. Happiness triggers people to connect with God, to sing songs or to lift up prayers. I mean, consider those landmark anniversaries. Five years or 10 years or 25 years or 50 years of wedded bliss or happy marriage, anyhow. Often we celebrate with a meal and usually lots of thank yous, including thank yous to God. And sometimes, 
in prayer. And so James establishes that principle, right? That we can talk to God about awesome things that we're excited about. We can talk to God when we're facing trouble. And any time in between, we can talk to God. In fact, James kind of wants you to have God on speed dial. And so what kind of times have you had that? That you have faced a situation and that all you could do in response, whether positively or negatively, you, you just responded by pouring out your heart to God. Then, James gets specific, and perhaps you can relate. Is any one among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayers offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If you haven't experienced it yet, you probably will at some point. Getting sick changes everything. Serious sickness is serious business. It calls for sharing concerns and worries, sharing the burden with other people, raising our concern for each other in prayer to God. Think about the time when James was writing. There was no emergency room in his day. There was no intensive care unit, no ventilators, very few meds. And those that practiced medicine in James's day were usually associated with a temple. They were priests of some kind of God. In fact, in James's day, seven out of ten doctors recommended big offerings to the priests of Asclepius. Well, I don't know really if those are the actual stats, but a lot of them, the doctors in that day, were associated with Asclepions, with healing centers, in the name of the god of healing, Asclepius. You can see from the hospital in Pergamum, this diagram that I have, that the healing centers in James' day were holistic. They had temples, had temples in them, of course, but they also had theaters in them and baths in them and places to hear lectures about healing. There were places there where you could offer sacrifices. There were places there that you could bring your gifts and have them on display so everybody would be impressed. Most priests then were related to Asclepius and the worship of that god in the Roman pantheon. Luke, however, was a doctor that we learn about in the New Testament who was different. I don't know what his training was before he became a Christian, but as he did his research for writing his gospel, he heard story after story after story of the way that Jesus healed in answer to people's requests. And as he compiled the book of Acts, again, story after story of Jesus healing in response to the prayers of James or Peter or Paul. The early Christians, including James, as he writes this letter, were convinced that Jesus was the one who gave healing. And so, there was reason to ask God for healing and talk to the great physician. And then there's no reason for a Christian to suffer alone. They pictured the church as a body. If one part of the body was suffering, they all felt the sting of it. If one of them was honored, well, all kind of basked in shared glory. So when intensive care was called for, the community would come together and the elders led in prayer and anointed the person who was sick, trusting that God would do exactly what was right for that individual, including heal them. Why were they anointed with the oil? Well, that anointing, that oil, is a reminder of baptism. It's a reminder of God's favor. It's a reminder that all Christians share in Jesus, Christ's anointing. Christ means anointed. Christian means that we share in Jesus' anointing. 
And Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit and with power to serve as prophet and priest and king. And so we as Christians share that anointing also to serve as prophet, priest, and king and have the gift of the Holy Spirit, God living in us and giving us power and authority so that we can call on the name of God and He will answer in powerful ways. And one of the ways that we call on God, well, the main way that we call on God is in prayer. What's prayer, you might be wondering? Well, prayer is not really all that complicated. Simply put, it's talking to God. I mean, that requires a degree of faith, of course, or at least hope, wishing that God hears what we're saying. And it kind of assumes that God cares about you, about what you say, what you think, what your hurts and concerns are. And when you're praying you admit that you're reaching out for help from a God who is bigger and stronger and wiser, more powerful than you are. That wisdom is one of the things that Jesus mentioned when he was teaching about prayer in Matthew chapter 7. He reminds us of how parents always want the best for their kids. And so he, he kind of asks a bunch of questions. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Well, no one. Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? Again, no one. If you then, though you are evil, and kind of like practical jokes, if you though, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask Him? That's the takeaway here. That God always gives good gifts to those who ask Him. I know it's not always easy to see the goodness in God's gifts. It's not always easy to see that God answers prayer in ways that are good for us. I mean, I've heard people get frustrated with God's answers or apparent lack of answer to their prayers. Some people grow cynical or even frustrated with God because even after months and months of asking and hoping and praying, they simply don't get that Lego set that they had been asking and hoping for for Christmas. Or they haven't found that soulmate, the person they long to be with the rest of their life. Or the memory loss that's starting to become a problem keeps on progressing, even though they've been begging and pleading and asking God to make it stop. But we don't always see the goodness in God's responses to our prayer because our sight is limited. We, we don't see the whole picture. God sees our needs from His heavenly perspective. He judges our needs simply from different criteria. And so nothing is as good, nothing is as bad as it might seem at first glance. There's a Chinese parable that I heard from another preacher. It goes something like this. In China, there was an old man and his son who lived in a house by themselves. And they had a horse, a horse that one day showed up missing. And the neighbors came around and kind of felt sorry for them and offered their condolences. But the old man said, well, how do you know this is bad? After a couple days of being missing, the, the horse came back and behind it was this whole herd of other wild horses that followed it into the paddock and they shut the gate. And the neighbors were really excited and said, well, how awesome, they said to the old man, look how rich you've become. How do you know this is good, answered the old man. And with all those horses, the son thought, well, I can do something with this. And so he started training them, started riding them. And along the way, he got bucked off and broke his leg. And again, the neighbors came around and tisk tisk and said, oh, that's too bad. And the old man said, well, how do you know this is bad? 
And so then war broke out in that area. And the army started recruiting everybody that they could get their hands on. And the young man, well, he had a broken leg. There was no way he could serve. And so he got passed over, didn't need to go to the front lines and fight. This is the point that the preacher made. Nothing is good and nothing is bad until God gets through with it. Even the pain that you've suffered, the failure that you've smashed your head on, the loss that you've encountered, not one of these things is a complete story in itself. And so what do you do with these perspectives or with these experiences that you've had, the gifts that you've received from God? From God's perspective, these things are good. They're gifts from Him that we receive maybe not always easily with thanks but with trust that God is in control and He knows what He's doing. So where are you in your prayer growth, your, your growing and ability to talk to God? Are you able to trust God and say, your will be done? Because for every story of a miraculous answer to prayer, there's one or two or three other stories of longing and waiting and disappointment. So what do you think? Is prayer useless? Learning patient endurance in prayer isn't always that satisfactory, is it? And yet our Heavenly Father is redeeming and healing on a global scale. He's not only interested in your short-term happiness, He's interested in your salvation. He's interested in the salvation of the entire world. He's looking forward to your eternal contentment as his people, his children. And like the rest of humankind, Jesus was completely human and had his own struggle with his father in prayer. I mean, think of that night just before he was arrested when he was wrestling in the garden in prayer. He knew that pain and suffering lay ahead. He was going to be executed, going to be hung from the cross. And so he begged and pleaded with his father if somehow there could be a different way to rescue humankind. But God's global plan for saving the world was at stake. And so after hearing Jesus please, the father strengthened and encouraged Jesus to go on. To proceed, painful though it was, for the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, they went ahead with their plan of rescuing the world through Jesus' death, through his descent into hell. And knowing only by going through those things could they come to the resurrection. There's another example I'd like to give. When Jesus' friend and disciple Peter was still alive. The disciples, the people that Peter was pastoring, got impatient for Jesus to return. They thought, well, it's been a long time since Peter saw him ascend and get hidden by the cloud. And, and that was 2,000 years ago. In his second letter, Peter explains why Jesus' return is delayed. Here's how he wrote it. They will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our ancestor died, ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You see that? The reason why Jesus isn't come yet is because he does not want anyone to perish. From your perspective, it might seem really great if Jesus was to return today, this afternoon. Wouldn't that be cool? That's kind of the wish that I heard again and again throughout 2020. This would be a good time, I heard people say, for Jesus to return. And as good as Jesus' second coming might be, Jesus is waiting until the full number of his chosen people have responded to the gospel promise. Until the full number of people has respented, have repented and put their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, as Lord. And so God's word speaks of patient endurance, 
of pressing on toward the goal, of keeping on, keeping on until Jesus returns. And so much as we hope for Jesus' return, as much as Jesus himself kind of wished there was a different way for him to redeem the world than to go through the cross, God's response to our prayer might not be exactly what we hope for. But it is exactly what God has determined we need, according to His wisdom. God always hears, always answers when His people talk to Him. He always hears and answers when you pour out your heart or even express your desires in prayer to Him. And when talking about healing, James speaks of God's interest not just in physical healing, but also in forgiveness, in reconciliation, in promoting a holistic idea like shalom. Shalom is a Hebrew word that expresses everything in its proper relationship. Peace, but, but broad peace. Everything in harmony. God's goal is restoring the world to the shalom that he intended when he created the place. He wants to make everything right in the world. And in order to do that, God needs to deal with well, our disobedience, our sin. And so James speaks of forgiveness of sin right alongside with physical healing. He says that in verse 15, The prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Raised up is the same expression it's used for talking about Jesus' resurrection. And so yes, it might mean that a sick person rises from their bed, but also might mean that a sinful person rises in Jesus Christ to new life, to new hope, to a new way of understanding God's call in their life. This section about gathering the elders and praying and anointing somebody who's sick was part of our devotions on Monday evening at the elders meeting, an elders meeting through Zoom. And we paused at verse 14 to kind of chew it over. And this is what it says. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And we kind of wondered together what kind of oil this needed to be. And when you go grocery shopping and you see all the different kinds that are there, I mean, is God looking for virgin olive oil or extra virgin olive oil? And how much do you use? Well, that was kind of fun, but we did get serious as well. The elders, Betty and Eric and Harry, shared some of their experiences with this passage. And we agreed together that this was something we could do. I mean, like everything else during the pandemic, it probably would look different than if there was no pandemic and no limits on visiting. But there's probably a way that we could honor a request like this and pray over someone and anoint them with oil and ask God for healing and forgiveness and restoration. Eh, it probably sounds like a shameless plug during a time when we're inviting you to submit your suggestions for who would serve well as an elder or as a deacon. I just want to say that responding to requests like this are one of the real cool privileges that elders and pastors get to enjoy. To be involved when someone reads God's word and this promise here in James chapter 5 and wants to do exactly what it says, well, experiencing that and then going ahead and doing it gives your own faith, your own obedience to God's word a real shot in the arm. It's a privilege to serve in these kinds of things. And I've had, as a pastor and teaching elder, opportunities to do this on several occasions. To pray and anoint people who were sick and ask the elders to gather. There's... Times in Fredericton that really stand out, two situations of women who asked the elders to come and to pray and anoint them. Both times we gathered in a living room with the family and with a number of elders. Both times we asked God for forgiveness and also for healing. 
And both times we anointed these women with oil. The first one was a lady in her 70s. God allowed this woman to die peacefully several weeks after we gathered for prayer and anointed her with oil. But she didn't say that this was an unanswered prayer. In fact, she said this was one of the best experiences she had during her sickness. By gathering for prayer and being anointed, it affirmed for her God's love, for her God's forgiveness. It put her at ease about what was going to happen if, when she passed away. And she was able to tackle those last few weeks of pain and suffering and sickness with a joy and a contentment that was different than what had gone before. For her, it was an important part of her healing, an important part of her reconciling her own will to God's will for her life. She did experience healing, though it wasn't completely what she thought it would be when she initially asked the elders to get together. The other one was a the other time was a woman in her 40s, and she was sick with cancer. She also spoke of the time of prayer as giving a sense of calm, a sense of contentment, a sense of God's deep, deep care for her, God's closeness in a really difficult time. And she continued to go through her cancer treatment. And that treatment caused the brain tumor to shrink. Eventually, the cancer went into remission. It might flare up at any time, but so far it hasn't. And in the meantime, since she had her cancer declared in remission, she's met a young man, and they got married, and they have set up their household, and she gets to enjoy a life of relative health, much beyond what she had ever hoped or imagined at that time when we gathered for prayer and anointed her with oil. Both times, this experience of praying and being anointed was a blessing, bringing healing for both of these women. And that's what God does. He's in the business of healing and restoring and renewing His dearly loved people, renewing and restoring His broken and soiled creation. I mean, that's the whole reason that Jesus came into His creation, from his long-sighted, global perspective, the Lord knew that something was wrong in this world and has taken steps to make it right, to set things straight. And it cost him, oh, it cost him dearly, the pain, the suffering of Jesus' death on the cross. But then his resurrection and the beginning of making all things new. It's by faith in what Jesus has done that we do have our sin forgiven, that we are made whole again. We're restored to being people after God's own heart and enjoying the opportunity to bask in His pleasure and, in times of trouble, to rely on God's help, on God's closeness, on God's care, and to be able to confess that in life or in death, we belong to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Because God loves you, because God loves His world, He always, always, always answers you when you pray. Our Heavenly Father has your absolute best interests at heart. And so, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what God's answer, when you pray, you win. And so the invitation is here in Scripture. By all means, pray when you're in trouble. When you're happy, sing songs of praise and pray. And when you're sick, God invites you, invites us to come together as a community and to pray for one another, to lay hands on each other, to anoint each other with oil, remembering that we enjoy God's care and His favor. We are God's people. We share in the anointing of Jesus Christ because we've been baptized both with water and by the Holy Spirit of God. Under the current restrictions, we don't get to 
do this the way that we ordinarily would be. But we can unite together in prayer, praying for healing for ourselves and for our community, knowing that God is in the process of renewing all things and setting things straight. With that said, <laughs> let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are really, really thankful for what you have done in restoring the world. We're thankful that you hear our cries just as surely as you heard the cries of the Israelites when they were enslaved in Egypt and the way that you delivered them with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. The way that you have rescued the world from sin and brokenness again in mighty powerful actions. Jesus rose from the dead, the very beginning, the first fruits of resurrection for all who have faith in Him. It's just astounding what you've done for us and for our salvation. So with all that soft set straight, it seems foolish that somehow we would imagine you didn't care about the other things that concern us, our hurts, our anxiety our mental illness, our injuries, physical illnesses. We are confident, on our best days at least, that you hear our prayers and that you're in the process of making all things new. Heavenly Father, we believe in you. Please help us when our faith wavers. In Jesus' name, Amen. I'm glad that you joined us for this time of worship. I don't know about you, but I enjoyed it and glad that you could participate. And we go out from this place with God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you shalom. And together we say, Amen.